question for about 15 minutes, okay? Hi there, Robin from Supercluster. What was your initial reaction to seeing this quote unquote picture perfect mission? Um, it was pretty exciting for us, of course, you know, knowing that this is the, the last launch before we're scheduled to get on that Falcon 9 rocket and ride that capsule to, to orbit. So it was exciting for us. You know, we've been at this for five uh, years almost uh, as, as a part of the commercial crew program, supporting directly as astronauts in addition to our roles before. So it's been a long time building and, and really was an exciting day. Does the uh, deployed work test change anything about your schedules and training and anything like that going forward from today up to launch? or is there just uh, you continue on with your regular schedule? Yeah, I think it's pretty much as advertised, although we lost today, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's about it. Uh, you know, I think obviously a, a successful completion kind of puts a little more clarity into the rest of our training and, and you know, potentially a launch date, a real launch date, and those kinds of things. So uh, I think that's, those are all good things. But when do they start talk talking to you guys about the launch date? <laughs> they don't. Really, our job is to be ready yeah, when the just launch date actually turns up, and so we'll do our, our best and be sure that we, we are ready and have done as much as we can for that date. And you know, I think, heard earlier, I think that there's questions about the duration and things like that. Right. And uh, we'll be ready when they pick the date, and that will go into all the things that have to be ready. We're just one of those uh, one of those things, and we just try really hard not to be the one. Would you prefer a longer duration? <laughs> We would prefer the right duration, both to take care of space station, but to accomplish all the objectives that we need to, to really set the future crews up to keep you know, station taken care of the way that it needs to be taken care of. Was it stressful um, watching space launch? Um, you, know, you guys will be on board next time. Sure. And this is not something you want to happen in April. So how, how was it, you know, how closely were you monitoring up your you know, families? Or, or how well, I, I, our families were certainly watching from back home. Uh, obviously, they're keenly interested in, in those kinds of things. I mean, it was a, you know, you have a whole bunch of different things that go through your mind <coughs> and emotions that you experience during a launch. Obviously, this is a key one leading up to our launch, so I think that part of it is pretty exciting. Um, and you want it to go well, but you also want to, you want it to go well because we did all the work we needed to do to get to this point, and the things work the way they're supposed to. And so far, that that's the case, but, you know, once we get the vehicle back, it's on, it's on board the ship now. It was on board the ship a, a little less than two hours after it landed in the water. So uh, that was pretty neat to see. And then, you know, we'll see what the data shows and, and go from there. But it certainly is a, it's a confidence builder from the standpoint of if you ever got into that situation <coughs> that Dragon can get us away from the very quickly. Exactly. Uh, like how much better is the Crew Dragon abort system from a crew's perspective than a space shuttle where you have black zones or dead zones where you you yeah, I think it's, uh, it's almost as if Dragon has kind of two vehicles when you get in it, right? One that's going to take you into orbit, and you've got that Super Draco system to accomplish the escape that you need to accomplish the escape. So it's a completely separate system that allows that to get accomplished. And, you know, uh, on the shuttle, we kind of reuse the kind of the nominal systems in kind of off-nominal ways to accomplish the transatlantic abort or the return to launch side. And so uh, not having those black zones is really comforting, you know, from my perspective, to have the ability to get away if anything uh, uh, was going wrong. And, and on top of that, I think in addition to that escape system, we also have a much smaller rocket to deal with uh, just because of the size. And so the safety long term should be should be much better than the shuttle program. So before you be the shuttle, former shuttle astronauts and everything, when you practice the actual day of stuff back on Friday, how did that differ? And how is that similar? Is it a more relaxed, like, like more relaxed since you're not going out there and sitting on your backs for three hours? You know you're, like, can you, can you talk a little bit about the differences between that process? I think, uh, just as a, a kind of a review, shuttle was longer because of the same same kinds of situations. You know, you had the five minute launch window with Dragon, we have instantaneous. Uh, but the difference was, is there all the polling and all the checks that they needed to do for fueling happened after we got on board and seven people took longer, all those things. But I think generically, it, it's pretty similar up until we get in the vehicle. Then once we're in the vehicle, we're, we're in there roughly two and a half hours prior to launch is, is, is the nominal timeline. And then they start fueling about 35 minutes prior to launch. So uh, that is obviously drastically different. We've never done that with a, with a, a human-rated vehicle where we fuel it after the crew's on board. So that'll, 
obviously that's a different experience. But generally, the lead up, especially the rehearsal we did the other day, is, it is very much similar to what we did for shuttle launches. It's just a little less on the back time, which is always appreciated. I guess I would describe it as it was really familiar. Yeah, having gone through it before a couple of times for space shuttle, this you know was executed in a very similar fashion. Same building, same room that we did it before. Yeah, crew quarters is exactly the same. A little bit different. Transportation. <laughs> <laughs> different transportation to the pad and from yeah. the pad, but uh, other than that, you know, the, it was really familiar at least from my perspective. Where were you? Let's start over here. Just kind of get it organized. Let's yeah. How are? This is really exciting for us. Certainly exciting, and, you know. But keep in mind, this is somebody said it. Well, it's been said many times. Space flight's like the biggest team sport there is. So we are just the lucky ones that get to fly the spaceship. But there's so many people that have put years and years in the commercial crew program at NASA, at SpaceX, at Boeing. You know, it, it's a it's a huge effort to get it to this point from eight and a half years ago since we flew shuttle last. So uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, so I, I mean, it's 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 very humbling, certainly, and it's exciting. Uh, we also are trying to keep our focus on you know the technical matters, the operational matters, and trying to get the vehicle ready to go so that when we fly it, everything goes the way it's supposed to. And then you know the the critical part is certifying the vehicle for future groups. You know the the turtles that just graduated. You know you know making it a, a great vehicle for those guys. So and it's and a the huge. private citizen astronauts that will go too, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think all that, all those options are, are on the board. Um, certainly not on our flight. At least if we have been told we're yeah. flying with somebody else. But uh, <laughs> uh, but it but it is. It's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's to create that opportunity, great. and I think that's the ultimate yeah. goal: is to create that opportunity for uh, more and more folks to have the opportunity that we've already had on space shuttles, and uh, uh, hopefully drag in CSP 100 and then more vehicles. I think the administrator said that earlier. That's the ultimate goal is to increase that access opportunity. Um, um, where were you exactly this morning, and what were you able to see? Did the clouds get in the way, and did you see the capsule coming down? I'm just trying. We were in firing room four, uh, same place that we were for the demo one launch, which is right over here in the launch control center at the, on the Kennedy, Kennedy side, so just kind of right across the road from where you guys are right now. We had access to pretty much all the telemetry and all the video that was available, and so we were able to see the capsule. They had a, an aircraft that was tracking the pad before liftoff, and then picked up the vehicle soon after as it uh, was visible through the clouds by the plume being just so bright, and we were able to watch it pretty much through the entire flight profile and uh, watch it all the way to the point that it came on board the boat. So, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Ah, oh, hey, how's it going? So, uh, not that you guys aren't as fast as a computer or anything, but what are your actual options as astronauts and as phenomenal pilots to actually control the vehicle? You know, especially how do you turn around port um, after that point? You know, it was fueled on the pad until we are safely in orbit. So uh, it's a pretty unique capability as far as hand flying the vehicle during asset. We had some capability uh, with the shuttle, but we don't have that with this vehicle. So if it becomes a case of vehicle is hard to control that obviously either manually or automated either or off the off the route. Hi Lauren Gresh with the Verge. Um, so I'm curious to know what your lives are gonna be like for the next couple of months, how you plan if you can't take any vacations or in the we future. In a while. What's that <laughs> really? <laughs> We got a little bit of break for the holidays, yeah. and uh, I know that the, the SpaceX team did as well, and that was, I think, good for all of us to kind of go forward here. And you know, we are we're planning week to week just to best optimize where the best place to spend our time, whether it's here in Florida or out in Hawthorne or back in Houston. And I know decisions have to be made in terms of what our ISS, you know, space station responsibilities are going to be when we get there, and that will play into it as well. And so, you know, week to week, we just had a scheduling meeting after. Uh, we launched today, uh -huh. and after for the, the next two vehicle weeks, was yeah. on the, I think that, that uh, it wasn't even on work wasn't even on the boat yet. And that's when we, we <laughs> had a schedule discussion for what we're going to do next week. So we'll we'll, uh, we'll travel cross country uh, at least once in the next week, and uh, we'll go from there. And our guest list was due on Friday. 
Sounds like really <laughs> <laughs> For those who have requested interviews with him, that's why I'm slow in getting back to you. Over here. Yeah, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Uh, can you talk about your roles on the DM2 mission? Uh, when you're doing any manual flying, the docking will be automated or a manual docking? And who's sort of commander and co pilot? Yeah, we're. Uh, our plan is to do some manual flying, uh, kind of at what we call the far field, and then closer to ISS. The, the normal plan um, is to do an automated dock. Um, ideally, it would be nice to test that capability. And then for the, for the mission, I'm the vehicle commander, and Bob's the vehicle pilot. Okay. Are we here? Yes, sorry. Okay, so famously in the right stuff, you know, there's a conflict between um, maybe engineers and the astronauts who want to more hand fly the vehicle, just sort of following on from these other questions about amount of control that you guys have. Um, really, how do you feel about that? Are you, are you comfortable um, with the amount of control you have of the vehicle? I mean, having no, no sort of black zones and being able to abort any time must, you know, alleviate that a little bit. I think we're comfortable with where we are on this vehicle and, and part of that has to do with the mission that's in front of us and so if you lay out the mission very specifically and then you put the tools in place to protect you and I, and I think our posture pretty much is that we have a pathway home in all circumstances we don't necessarily have a pathway to save the mission in all circumstances and so that's the posture that we're in that's a little bit easier when the mission is really well defined like launch and dock the space station if you make the mission much more complicated than that what capabilities you need to have to to stay safe it's a little bit harder for example if you're trying to accomplish a, a landing on the moon you don't necessarily the, the path home might be all that manual capability it might be the same as continuing as it is to uh, uh, kind of go backwards if you will and so in our case we tend to have the capability to go backwards to, to, to do something safe, but not necessarily save the mission. And what I definitely appreciate, the more complex the mission is, the more capability you really need to, you know, to make sure you do have those safety outs. So as is right now, because it's essentially to and from the ISS. Mission is well defined, and we have a safe path out of all of the situations that we're in, which is what our, what our design criteria is. If you make the mission more complex, you need more capability, which rapidly gets you into a case of just give it to you, give us everything. So guys have been up for a little while, so um, we'll take just this one last question. I am Jim Siegel. I'm with uh, NASA Tech. And I'm, I was curious as to whether uh, you have been uh, practicing specific tasks that you might be doing up at the International Space Station. Have you been given ex certain uh, uh, investigations to help with or what? So far on Space Station, our responsibility is to take care of ourselves while we're there, not make a mess. From a hygiene perspective, and, uh, uh, but we don't have payload responsibilities on board ISS uh, at this time. We haven't done training for that. We've done a little bit of preparation uh, um, just in case some of the really long lead items. Uh, I've done some EMU glove fit checks because that hardware has to fly and it has a long pathway to space station, but I haven't done the training associated with that hardware just yet, and so those decisions still still have to be made. Yeah, we'll have, you know, Bob's primary long lead item responsibility for as a station crew member would be EVA and mine would be robotics, and then, you know, just the normal ISS living stuff, we've done some of that over the last year and a half or two years, but, you know, if the, if the duration changes significantly, then there would be more added on and some maintenance classes and then some payload classes and those kinds of things. So, you know, we're there, as, as, as Bob said, as a help for, you know, potentially just Chris and his two Russian crewmates if we, if we get up there at that point some, sometime, I think it becomes a three-person crew sometime in mid-April. So, you know, that's kind of where they want us to at least be there to be helpful. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, y'all. Thank, we'll thank you guys. You guys. Thank you.